So Jane Addams um, was a sociologist who was also writing um, uh, around the time of some of our classic sociological thinkers, writing between the um, 1890s and early 1900s. And Jane Addams was an incredibly important historical figure, um, uh, internationally renowned, and essential to the early sociology and to the development of social work as a discipline. Um, and Jane Addams, uh, uh, I think, should be added to our collection of major or early American and European thinkers in sociology. You'll notice that all of the classical thinkers that I um, speak about, uh, Marx, Weber, Durkheim, Du Bois, and now Jane Addams, are from the United States or from Europe. Um, uh, that's not a mistake. In part, it's the, the formation of the early canon of sociology or the formalization of whose ideas mattered. Located was located primarily in the U.S. and Europe. Um, and James Adams was a, uh, a social reformer, a scholar, um, and an activist. And she um, uh, actually published in the premier or one of the premier sociology journals, the American Journal of Sociology. Um, many times in its earliest uh, issues and had a very uh, particular approach that I will associate with pragmatism, um, which is a kind of philosophy, um, philosophical tradition that primarily emerged in the United States around the time that Adams was working and writing. So from the late 18 to early 1900s. Um, Adams was a social reformer. Um, and uh, it's important to note that Du Bois, who uh, I spoke about in the previous lecture, or a previous lecture, was also a major social reformer. So Du Bois, for example, um, helped found the NAACP and was majorly involved in a range of movements in order to address the issues of race in the United States. And as his career advanced, and he lived to a very old age, um, he became increasingly interested in what uh, we would call intersectionality. So thinking about the interrelationship between race and class, as well as increasingly interested in thinking about this globally. So not just focusing on the United States, but looking globally. Jane Addams, I'm bringing in in part to think about the conditions of women and to bring gender into the sociological analysis um, that has largely been absent from the discussions in Marx and Weber and Durkheim. It's not that Marx, Weber, and Durkheim never talk about gender, but they don't really spend a lot of time thinking about gender relations. Um, uh, Durkheim has a few discussions of uh, women in one of his classic books, Suicide. Um, um, uh, Marx's co-author, Engels, writes really a, an important treatise on the family that thinks a little bit about gender, but for the most part, these guys are just totally sort of ignoring the dynamics of gender. And um, this is another major failure in classical or early um, uh, sociology. So whereas with Du Bois, I said, you know, like Marx and Weber and Durkheim all basically ignored the dynamics of race um, and the ways in which people would be categorized by and experience racial relations, um, now I'm going to talk about the ways in which they also um, uh, largely missed gender dynamics. And Jane Addams, both through her writing, but also through her social activism, um, uh, brought gender to the fore. And this is not a small, like, uh, miss in terms of things that people didn't talk about. Like, women make up, after all, more than half of the world. And so, you know, if you construct a theory of society that doesn't have an understanding of gender within it, um, what you effectively do is ignore huge swaths of social relationships. Now, it's important to note that men have gender too, and we'll, get, we'll, come, we'll, we'll have a longer discussion in future lectures about thinking about gender and race relationally and recognizing the ways in which gender and race are socially constructed. For now, um, I want to bring us back to the city in the late part of the 19th century and the ways in which cities were um, just these kind of, as I said in the early lectures, these really difficult places for people to live. 
um, that early cities didn't really have sanitation, that there were there weren't really labor rules. So people could and children could work long hours. People worked long hours and they didn't just work long hours. They often worked in tremendously unsafe conditions. And one of the consequences of this was that the group of people who were the poorest in the city were frequently women. Um, women whose um, uh, husbands or partners abandoned them, women whose husbands or partners died in industrial accidents, um, women who uh, ended up frequently with children um, uh, um, with no real way to make a wage, um, sometimes having to rely upon prostitution, and uh, living in cities in some of the worst conditions of poverty. And Jane Addams, uh, among many others, saw this and became part of social reform movements. And one of the things that I want you to take away from both an understanding of Jane Addams and from Du Bois was a vision of scholarly work as part of scholar activism. That being a scholar doesn't mean just studying the world. It requires that we engage in it. And this was a profound impulse of Du Bois, who not just who didn't just produce numerous sort of exceptional studies of social life, but who also probably maybe even spent more time writing for newspapers, constructing organizations, attempting to do things where he drew upon his sociological insights in order to transform the conditions under which we all live. And today, we think about this as a form of scholar activism or a ways in which the scholars don't just study the world, but they engage in it. And some argue that the position of a scholar as someone who doesn't do this, who just sort of sits in their office and thinks great thoughts, is the position of tremendous privilege that very few can afford. Um, and that doesn't fundamentally do scholarship in the ways in which it should be done. What your position on this is, I don't really mind. We'll, we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of both throughout the course of these lectures. For now, um, what I'd like you to think about is how it is that Adams really put her ideas into practice. She put her insights into practice through a series of interventions into everyday life. Now, as an aside, I'll note that um, Karl Marx was also someone who wrote extensively about the necessity for socialist transformation. So um, he himself was deeply engaged in the movements um, that were happening throughout Europe in order to usher in socialism or a response to um, capitalist organizations. And Emil Durkheim, similarly, was deeply engaged in social reform movements. In particular, as we said earlier, Durkheim was a scholar of moderation and really thought about the necessity of intervening in um, um, societies in such a way that would help improve them. But neither of them come close to um, what people like Adams and uh, Du Bois did. So there are two things I'd like you to, rem to learn about uh, Jane Addams. The first is going to be her location in the American pragmatist tradition or school of thought. And then the second is her experience in Hull House, H-U-L-L, -L, Hull House. So the first is to understand pragmatism as a critically important philosophical movement that Adams was deeply a part of. And that pragmatism originated in the U.S. around 1870 and um, presents a kind of alternative to what we refer to today as analytic and continental philosophy. So um, by that, we mean basically two different strands of European philosophy. And, you know, the, the, this um, philosophical tradition was advanced by um, um, uh, Pierce and uh, William James, and um, effectively, the philosophical tradition argues that understanding the world um, uh, requires action within it. That is, to understand anything about the world, you need to be of that world. 
And so um, the, the, the idea isn't, is that like, um, if a theory doesn't contribute directly to social progress, it's not really worth that much. And that experience is transacting with rather than representing nature or the world around you. So here, I'm going to focus on two properties of pragmatism. The first is that if the theory doesn't contribute directly to social progress, then it's not really worth much. And then the second is that like experience consists in transacting with rather than representing nature. So the first idea is that in order for us, you know, to have a theory about the world, it should have some practical implication for transforming the conditions of that world. Sometimes pragmatism and practicality are allied, or, or we allied them, so we, we put them together a little bit. But the fundamental insight is like, is this a difference that makes a difference? So if you observe something about the world, is it just like an observation, or is it an observation that could potentially change something? change something in particular in terms of changing it for the better. So, you know, abstract theorization or just contemplation about ideas is only useful insofar as it engages with the everyday world. It's a very different orientation to other forms of philosophy, um, which sometimes take the form of like mathematical proofs. So they don't really care at all about the world. Instead, it's about the structure of logic, which often is presented as being very abstracted from the world. It's just, what is the logical implication of an idea? And can I work through those logical implications? This is a very different approach, which is to say that like concepts are valuable insofar as they're useful. And if they're not useful for interventions, practical interventions in the world, we shouldn't pursue them. Or, you know, like, what is the point of this? And so this is a kind of, it's not surprising that this comes from the United States. Like, it's a very um, U.S. cultural kind of tradition, which is like, what is the practicality of this idea? How is it that this idea can engage in social reform within the world around us? The second position of pragmatism is that understanding comes through experience. Not just through experience, but essential to any form of understanding is that the world is inseparable from what we do within it. And that has the first implication built in, which is that like, if we're gonna have a theory, it should have some practical implication. But the second implication is that knowing, knowing, comes in part from transacting with rather than representing nature. So we have to interact with the world in order to understand it. And that our practical lived experience matters. That practical lived experience matters as the foundation for knowledge. Now, this in some ways is in tension with parts of, but allied with other bits of the European philosophical tradition. But to fully understand this, I want to give you the example of Hull House, the second major thing I wanted you to, to, to know from Adams. And um, uh, Hull House was a place that Adams formed with the support of a range of other women who were also social reformers and also wealthy to try and alleviate the conditions of poverty of women in the city of Chicago. Chicago is an incredibly important city for the study of social life. It has historically been one of the primary places where sociological um, insights have come from. Uh, and there's sort of a, a range of, of, of reasons for this, um, um, but one of the primary ones is that Chicago was a major place that immigrants went to um, and that there were a range of immigrant enclaves throughout Chicago. So a series of neighborhoods where different kinds of immigrants live. And the University of Chicago, um, the great un one of the great universities, there are three great universities in Chicago, but the University of Chicago became sort of a home of this pragmatist impulse and a place 
where scholars said we need to go out into the city and study and engage with that city in order to produce a, a, like a proper sociology or a defensible sociology or a kind of distinctly American sociological tradition. And Jane Adams was deeply involved in the sociology department at the University of Chicago. She published in their journal. She worked with many of the sociologists who helped found that and run that department for a long period of time. And one of the things that she gave them access to was Hull House. So what was Hull House? Hull House was a space for poor women in Chicago. And it was a space um, where Adams and a range of social reformers put their ideas into practice and experimented with them and saw the effectiveness of different kinds of interventions to alleviate the conditions of women who were living in poverty in Chicago, particularly women who had either had spouses who died or partners who died or women who had been abandoned and had children. And there were sort of multiple features to Hull House, but one of Adam's ideas was of social uplift. And the idea of social uplift was that middle-class women could and should engage with poor women in order to help improve their life conditions, teach them things that were important, and help lift them up out of the conditions of poverty. And so Hull House was a place where hundreds, even thousands of poor women came through to be taught things, to be given a range of resources, and to develop social relationships with middle and upper class women who might be able to help them and help alleviate the conditions of their poverty. What made this pragmatist was in part the experimental nature of uh, Adams's orientation where she had some ideas, she tried them out and put them into practice, she evaluated them and she reformed them. And so her conceptualization of poverty was not just to theorize about poverty, what is poverty, how do we understand it, et cetera. Instead, it was to intervene in poverty, to try and transform the conditions of poverty and to do so in a deeply practical way, a way where she was a social scientist in my view, in part because she was deeply attuned to evidence she would try out policies, and if the policies didn't work, she would revise them in the hope of transforming the interventions that she was making in order to improve the conditions of the peoples who's, who were suffering in Chicago, particularly women. Adams didn't quite have like a fully developed theory of gender, so we shouldn't think of Adams as like a gender theorist. Um, but she was primarily interested in women, which is somewhat unique to the classical thinkers. She also, like Du Bois, was deeply concerned with social intervention and with thinking about sociology, not just as a science that studies society, but as a practice that intervenes in society. So that our scientific insights are only useful insofar as they have practical implications that we attempt to put into place and that we revise in light of evidence. This is a deeply scientific orientation insofar as it says that insights need to be constantly and practically evaluated in real world situations in order to create the conditions both of social reform that improves people's lives as well as that our understanding be based in an empirical reality rather than a conceptual one. That is, that our understanding be constantly re-evaluated in light of practical experience. So Adams, like Du Bois, is both a social scientist in the sense that they are deeply entrenched in intellectual traditions uh, and publish within those intellectual traditions, but that they view the project of science as not just studying the world, but intervening within it and intervening within it in Adams's case in deeply practical ways that is subject to constant evaluation and reevaluation. Adams and Du Bois had rich lives beyond just this. Adams won the Nobel Peace Prize. Um, she was a major pacifist. She was a part of a wide range of reform movements 
um, throughout the United States. So we've only just sort of scratched the surface of her thinking, of her interventions. She had deep commitments to democracy, for example. But for now, I want you to think about sort of the construction of a canonical thought that is just Marx, Weber, and Durkheim as not like a necessary construction, but instead something that a group of people kind of decided upon, which often left others out. And Adams sometimes gets left out of this tradition. And I think it's important to claim her, not just because she brings into view a range of things that the classical thinkers were missing, like gender relations, but also because she's part of a major intellectual tradition, um, an intellectual tradition of pragmatism that is still something that scholars like myself struggle with today. Struggle with, I don't mean in a bad way. I just mean we attempt to make sure that the ideas that we present, some of us, have a practical implication and that that practical implication should be evaluated and reevaluated, and that we ask ourselves, is this right in the lived experience of people? What are the implications for how we can, con can contribute to the alleviation of suffering in the world? And how might we reevaluate our ideas in light of what's happening on the ground?